Okay, so it's one o'clock, so I'll go ahead and let everybody in. Sounds good. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm gonna give it just a minute to allow everyone to come in from the waiting room and get their audio connected. So thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Teaching Tips for Online Instruction and Engagement. My name is Brittany Boston, and I am with the Illinois Center for Specialized Professional Support out at Illinois State University. And so I will be your facilitator for today's webinar. Um, just a few housekeeping items before I hand it over to my colleague who will be presenting for today. I do wanna let you know that um, as participants, you are muted, but we are in a Zoom meeting. And so you are able to unmute yourself if you would like. Um, if you want to ask a question or answer a question that Kirsten may present, and you're also able to share your webcam. So if that is something you don't want to do, just be mindful of that. Um, we do want you guys to engage and interact as much as possible. Um, and you can also, if you have a question and maybe you don't want to unmute yourself, you do have the little chat box that you can type your question or comment into. Just make sure that that too says everyone so that the presenter, myself, and the other participants on the webinar today can see your question and comment. Um, this is being recorded, and so we will be sharing out the recording as well as the slides from today on our website um, later in the week once we get that all downloaded and uploaded to the website. And so I think that is all of the housekeeping items I have. So without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Kirsten Baer. Thank you so much, Brittany, and welcome everyone. Thank you for spending this Wednesday afternoon with us. Um, again, like Brittany said, you can go to the next slide, Brittany. My name is Kirsten Bayer, and I, um, along with Brittany, are uh, employed by the Illinois Center for Specialized Professional Support within Illinois State University. Um, I have a bachelor's degree in communications and a master's degree in communications as well. Um, well I guess my bachelor's degree is in public relations. I should be more specific. Um, but I am credible to speak to you all about this online engagement within teaching virtually because I actually am in your shoes. I teach an adjunct virtually. I have been doing it this whole year. Um, I have about three years of adjuncting teaching experience um, and, you know, GA and TA teaching experience prior to that. Um, I've been in your shoes this whole last year, learning how to transfer my classroom over to a virtual setting, learning how to teach that hybrid um, course content, learning how to, you know, do group work in a virtual setting to do class activities in a virtual setting. So transferring everything that you've spent, you know, so much time, um, building some, all your content for your class. And I've been there in your shoes, you know, transferring over that content, um, to that virtual platform that we've all been forced to utilize this year. Um, so I was teaching in March of last year. So I flipped with all of you. Um, and as the online marketing coordinator for our center, all of our PD is now online as well. And pretty much everything we do for our center this year has been online. So I've been eat, sleep and breathing online virtual engagement, um, this whole year and actively teaching that online practices. And I'm going to teach you guys about some of the online practices that I've implemented within my own classroom and why I feel like it, it is beneficial to teach online instruction. Um, yeah, so let's get started. So next slide, Brittany. So first I want to know from all of you, like before we start talking about all the great things and positive things that we're going to talk about today, I want to know from all of you, what has been the most discouraging thing about online instruction this year? Um, and you can respond in the chat or you can feel free, feel free to unmute yourself. 
What is the number one thing that has been the most discouraging about online instruction this year? I think one thing for me has been um, just not being able to see my students' faces. Like most of the time, you know, we want them to turn on their cameras, but sometimes, you know, there's technical difficulties. Students will say, oh, I can't get it to work. Or um, like they, you know, sometimes maybe are just not, not feeling it and it's a struggle to get them to actually turn it on. So I've really missed actually seeing my students' faces and getting to know them. Um, even though some of them are, are doing fine with it. Yeah, great. Thank you, Elena. Um, and then we, we have some people in the chat who are saying personal connection. I think they're agreeing with you. Decrease in attendance. I've definitely seen that as well. Gray screens and lack of interaction, not being able to walk into the room. Students aren't as engaged. 40 minute limits on Zoom meetings. Oh, I bet that is really frustrating. Um, partner work learning learners are moving uh, background sounds difficulty hearing understanding what they're saying um, i completely sympathize with all of these i've had students who are attending class while they're in their cars driving which is very safe um i'd say not sarcastically um tech difficulties never seeing my students faces i do not know if my jokes are funny or not anymore i feel that andrea i do try to be, I guess, young and hip with um, some of my classroom content. And I'm going to show you some tips about what I do in a second here later on in the presentation. But I get that too. I feel like I'm kind of talking to a brick wall. Um, I don't know if you guys have heard this term, but I felt like my students this year have felt like zombies, like Zoom zombies. <laughs> um, they're, you know, just so strung out. And I think everyone is so strung out on technology this year. Um, it's just so redundant. And we're going to talk about, you know, some reasons for why our students are feeling like this and why ourselves are feeling like this as well. Um, Deborah says the struggle has been for students who have low digital literacy skills. I agree with that. Um, teaching at Richland, I teach a introductory course. So I have students who are from all ages and all backgrounds, um, both economically as well. So I've struggled with maybe my students have high digital literacy skills or medium level, but they just don't have the digital accessibility that other students do. And so we're going to touch on that today too. Thank you so much for participating in that um, conversation. So the encouraging thing about all of these discouraging items that we just talked about is that the key to a great online course is you, you, the instructor. And that puts a lot of responsibility on us as instructors, right? Um, it puts a huge learning curve on us this year. If you aren't as digitally, digitally literate, um, as you're, as an instructor yourself. Um, but I do feel like myself included, and I can only speak for myself, I feel like I've really grown in strides into how I implement um, my classroom on the online platform. And I am learning along with my students. It's no longer just me teaching them. We're learning together at this point in terms of the digital aspect of it, right? Um, and so I'm glad to know that I'm not the only one who feels a little deflated after this year, but we are going to cover how to build that connection and engagement in synchronous online learning sessions. Um, so hopefully this session, you guys will leave with some, some tips and tricks and some new resources that maybe you're not familiar with and you can expand on them past this hour session that we're together this afternoon. So some benefits of online instru instruction that I've seen throughout my day, as well as throughout my students' day, is the flexibility. I have students who are parents. I have students who are working full time. I have a student who is in the process of buying a house this semester. And, you know, he was having to go to bank meetings and appraisal meetings and things like that. And it was his first time buying a house. And so to have that flexibility of being able to attend class, you know, and then literally get out of his car and go to the meet the appraiser or whatever he needed to do, um, that really allowed for that flexibility and 
in return made it more accessible for students who potentially might not have been able to participate in my class um, or had been putting it off for a couple semesters because they weren't able to make the time slot, it allowed for them to attend. So that is a huge benefit of online instruction. Um, it also allows for new ways to collaborate. I think there are multiple ways and we're gonna touch on them a little bit more today. Some things that I think teachers just aren't aware of that are out there. I've learned so much this year, um, both from working with ICSPS and other instructors. I think ourselves are our best assets um, when it comes to learning because we don't know what we don't know, but hopefully one of our colleagues does and we can learn from each other. Um, so we'll be taking some time for that today as well. And then greater engagement and learning as well as efficiency. Um, and there is a downside to that efficiency because I do feel like we have to feel like we're always on and our students are feeling like that too. But the plus side is that we are more efficient. When the pandemic first happened, I think everyone was expecting people to be less efficient in their work life, not only in the education sector, but in the business sector and other sectors, um, the whole working world really, everyone was expecting people, um, employees to be less efficient, which in return, we actually are more efficient um, because we're missing out on those interactions in the office, but those things allow for more time to actually focus on our work. And then I do feel like a good benefit of online instruction is that enriching experience and really learning about how to learn online. Next slide, please, Brittany. Okay, so I wanna to touch on why it is so important for instructors and why that responsibility of having a good online course really does fall on you. And I don't want anyone to feel like I'm, you know, the reason you're, you're not having success in your online instruction is because of you, the instructor. I'm not blaming you or putting any blame on anyone at all. We're all learning together, right? But it is our responsibility as instructors and it's so important for us to engage with our students because we really are that initial, um, the initial person that breaks down that barrier that our students feel in person. And we have to translate that to online as well. Our students are still feeling that communication barrier when they're coming onto our online um, classrooms that they did before in our in-person classrooms. And it's our responsibility to break that down as instructors. And so the US Department of Education and the Higher Learning Commission have defined the difference between distance education and correspondence education as a regular and substanti substantive interaction between the students and the instructor. So the student cannot primarily in initiate interaction. It falls on the instructor um, and the instructor must initiate communication so only posting recorded lectures or only posting textual materials online, along with exams or quizzes, while those are great things and are needed within our online um, synchronous classrooms, it really just isn't enough. And actually it does not meet the federal HLC guidelines, the Higher Learning, Learning Commission guidelines. So it's important for us as instructors to be constantly learning about new ways to engage I don't know about your higher education institutions that you guys are working for, but I just got noticed yesterday actually that moving into the fall, while we are starting to transition to more in-person learning um, environments again, they will still be offering the synchronous hybrid online learning classes, um, about one section per class for those students who really do need it. And those students that it's not, um, deteriorating them from learning, but it's making it even more accessible for them to learn because they are parents at home, because they have, you know, those schedules that they're trying to balance. Okay, go to the next slide, please, Brittany. So next we're gonna talk about instructor course engagement strategies. And so the first strategy, next slide, Brittany, is to define your online presence. And this is extremely important because Defining your online presence, just like you would define your presence within a classroom, is the extent to which you come across as empathetic. It's the extent to which you form connections with your students and respond to your students as well throughout the course and throughout 
your relationship with them, your teacher um, student relationship with them. I still have, you know, professional relationships with prior students, um, as well as I still have professional relationships with prior instructors from when I was a student. Um, and so defining your online presence is very similar to defining that presence within your um, in-person classroom as well. And so basically it looks like defining your virtual self. And so some things you could do to do this would be to provide an introductory video to yourself as an instructor. Let your students in. You know, you were talking about joking around in your classroom. I mean, I don't know about you guys, but I teach from personal examples. So I talk about myself. I talk about my husband. I talk about my dogs. I talk about working with ICSPS. I use things that I'm living to teach as examples. And so um, really providing that introductory video to yourself, to your students, especially at the beginning of the semester, just lets them know that you are a person. You're not just a square on a Zoom link and you want to get to know them and you want them to get to know you as an instructor and as a person. Um, Another strategy you could do is to post still images of yourself in your introductory materials. Um, you could share your social media like Twitter or LinkedIn if you're comfortable um, or even after the semester's over. So that's something that I like to do to keep in, um, in contact with my students is I share my LinkedIn profile with them. After the semester is over, I encourage them to follow me on LinkedIn. I usually follow them back. And if they ever need, you know, a letter of recommendation or help with their resume in the future, or if they ever just need advice about, I mean, I deal with a lot of introductory students, so if they need advice moving forward or really just, I mean, you never know. I've, I've reached out to prior professors for a multitude of things. Um, I actually reached out to a prior professor for a PD session that's coming up soon that we're doing um, with our center. So it's always good to make yourself accessible as a contact in the future to your students as well. Um, you could also share your departmental website um, to help your students understand who you are and what you do and really what your role is at the college. Okay, um, so it really, defining your online presence really emphasizes your approachability as an instructor. And it emphasizes that you're gonna be an instructor that's gonna lead with empathy and be flexible. Um, obviously you still want to set those boundaries and that comes with your syllabus and your rules. And that is a part of defining your online presence, but you can still have those boundaries with emphasizing approachability and leading with empathy as well. And so every instructor is gonna define their virtual self differently. So what you really need to consider is what info you want to share about yourself and your work with your students and how are you going to translate that um, electronically by doing that introductory video, maybe by, you know, even just having like, I don't know if you use Canvas or um, a different LMS learning management system for teaching, but we use Canvas at Richland and just having a module about myself even helps my students kind of get to know me and they can refer back to it and relate to me as well. So next slide, please, Brittany. So you, the next strategy is to maintain an active daily presence in the course. I feel like we all know this is important to give frequent and substantive feedback throughout the course ask students, a good strategy that I found is to ask students to reply to your feedback or comments so that way they know that you know that they're seeing your comments. One of the most discouraging things for me this year is that I am not getting that feedback from students when I'm giving them feedback on their assignments or feedback on their, um, their coursework that they're turning into me. I don't know if they're really looking at it and really seeing it and really utilizing it because I can't necessarily follow up with them like I would in person in the classroom. So I ask my students to always reply to my feedback, even if it's just, you know, thanks for the feedback, something as simple as that to let me know that they are paying attention to the feedback or comments that I'm giving them. Um, also be explicit in the ways that students can reach you and your response time as well. 
there's nothing more frustrating, I feel like, to our students and nothing that gives them more anxiety is, especially in this online environment, as we can't, they can't see us in person and then they don't know if we're seeing, you know, their emails and their messages coming through. So it's important to do that as well. Um, to establish a conducive environment, also to not run on autopilot. Um, this is extremely important. Students feel more connected to instructors who talk to them as if they are in a one-on-one -on -one conversation. And some things you can do to not run on autopilot is to hold virtual student office hours, meet with your students one-on-one -on -one via Zoom, um, interact with students as they work. So even though we're in a Zoom setting, I still give my students um, like group time. I have a group project that I'll talk about how I implement that in a second, but I give them group time in class where I'm not lecturing them. They are just in breakout rooms um, in groups like they would be in person. And so I give them that time, but it's also time that if they have a question or if their group has a question, they can pop back into the main room and talk to me about it, even if it's not really related to that project. Just gives them added time to interact with you as the instructor, just like they would in class if you were giving them individual time and they were able to come up to you in class privately and communicate with you that way. Um, you can also send personalized how's it going messages via email or your LMS messages, however you communicate with your students. I try to do this two times a semester so that it's not a huge um, responsibility on myself. I'm not gonna constantly be messaging all my students, how's it going? Um, they are still responsible adults and I wanna treat them as such, but to just kind of check in and you know see how it's going, especially now that we're in this new online environment. So I try to do that two times a semester for all my students, not just my students who are struggling or might not be doing as well, because even my students who are doing as well, they might still need a check-in point as well. Um, try to have your camera on as the instructor and encourage your students to do so. We're gonna talk about screen fatigue on the next slide, but um, I want to emphasize that I don't require my students to have their Zoom cameras on. I encourage them to, and I found I started doing this this semester. I have found that the more I use positive reinforcement and encouragement to have my students' cameras on, the more they are willing to do so than if they did last fall. And I've also realized that students, when the more I do this, students have tended to let me know more this semester why they don't have their cameras on. So they're communicating with me and letting me know like, hey, I have my daughter with me on my lap, so that's why I don't have my camera on. So it's, you know, giving me more confidence as an instructor to let me know, okay, they, they are paying attention to me, but there's a reason why they don't have their camera on. Um, and so interacting with students as they work, I did touch on that. You can do this by dropping in a discussion board, acknowledging students by name and live sessions. So, you know, I remember my, I tend to try to remember my students' names um, by the second or third week in a live class. So you need to make this an uh, emphasis as well in the virtual realm too. Um, you may consider also doing this incorporating a slide that features a current event or a cartoon or a trivia question. I always do a quote of the day because I love quotes to start off my classes to kind of spark that conversation and talk about something other than what you're talking about in class. Um, I know our time is limited, but just to plan out that teaching time to take a couple minutes at the beginning of your class or potentially even at the end for your students to interact on a personal relationship basis with not only you as the instructor, but with each other as well. Okay, next slide, please, Brittany. So now I'm gonna touch about screen fatigue. I think this has probably been the most discouraging thing for us as instructors um, and as people who live in 2020 and 2021. Everything is online, everything is virtual. So this poses this question, should we require students to have cameras on? I wanna know what you think, so feel free to put that in the chat. Do you require your students to have their cameras on? Should you? Um, I think that's a huge question. So I wanted to bring this quote from an associate professor 
at NZ, and he states that our minds are together when our bodies feel we're not together. And that dissonance, which causes people to have conflicting feelings is exhausting. And you cannot relax into the conversation naturally, like we would in person. And that's really what causes screen fatigue. It's that dissonance between our minds thinking that we're together because we're communicating and our bodies feeling that we're not. And so this can um, actually cause things for our students that I've experienced as well as I reflect. Um, increased anxiety and stress, constant video engagement, um, competing obligations, our right to privacy and financial means and other kinds of accessibility are all reasons why we're experiencing screen fatigue and why we might wanna consider not requiring our students to have their cameras on. And so that increased feeling of anxiety and stress, our students are feeling that everyone is looking at you, you're on a stage, there comes, um, this comes with more social pressure and feeling the need to perform. I don't know if you've noticed this, but when I have my camera on, I tend to only look at myself and not other people. Um, and I tend to be more conscious of how I'm behaving in front of the camera, as opposed to actually paying attention to the other people who are on with me. And I do feel like our students are feeling that too. Um, and so also something that we're experiencing with screen fatigue is that silence creates a natural rhythm in real life conversations. However, when it happens in a video call or maybe when it happens in your online virtual classroom, you as the teacher or you as your students, if they're doing like a presentation or something like that, become more anxious about the technology not working. And so therefore they're so uncomfortable with the silence and that increases their anxiety and stress. I teach a speech class. And so when my students are giving their speeches, if they need to pause for a second, it is so hard, so much harder to get them to do that in a virtual setting than in, in person because they feel that silence isn't supposed to happen online when it's actually a part of our natural rhythm in real life conversations. Um, what's really interesting to me is that a 2014 study by German academics showed that delays on the phone or delays on online conferencing systems like Zoom shaped people's views negatively, even delays of 1.2 seconds made people perceive the responder as less friendly or less focused. So I don't know if you as instructors feel this, but if I'm quiet for more than, you know, a second, I feel that my students automatically think maybe I'm not on top of it that day, or I'm, you know, frazzled or whatever, but really I'm just, you know, transferring slides or something, you know, moving around, taking a drink of water even. Um, so that's uh, something that can help with that is having your camera on so your students can see you kind of um, do those, those normal things. And then constant video engagement may exasperate the problem. So video requires more focus than face-to-face -face chatting, which, so we have to work harder to process those nonverbal cues when we're online, like facial expressions, tone and pitch. And this type of multitasking is known as continuous partial attention. And our students are feeling this too. And so switching quickly like this can impair memory and decrease the ability to perform tasks. So even though we feel like our students are paying more attention to us when their cameras are on, it actually can create um, this multitasking known as continuous partial attention. And it can cause them to actually have more impaired memory and decrease the ability to be paying attention to us when they have their cameras on. And then also competing obligations. You know, we don't know what our students are dealing with at home. We would like to think, I know I would like to think that they're all at home in a quiet room free of distractions during their online class, but that's really just not the case. Um, and so they might be dealing with things like watching younger siblings, watching their own kids, um, and these distractions may be distracting or even embarrassing to some of the students involved. Um, so we have to take that into consideration as well. We also have to be cognizant of our students' right to privacy. So allowing others into their homes when they're turning on their Zoom camera, things that we can do, strategies, we can you know, ask them to have a virtual background. But again, we have to teach our students how to do that. Um, so that would be a good strategy to kind of work around that right to privacy. But something that I don't think a lot of um, teachers are really aware of is that it can cause discomfort, but 
some students are actually scared to turn their cameras on because they're exposing their information and it can potentially endanger their lives or their families. So 3.2 million undocumented children and young adults in the um, US live here and many more live with undocumented relatives. And so they could be dealing with something like um, showing their camera on their online video could risk exposing this information to um, authorities. So we want to be cognizant of all the things that our students are dealing with at home as well as financial needs and other kinds of access. I know I talked about this earlier and this is something I've dealt with my students a lot, um, making assumptions about students' ability to have their video on or students' ability or their families to pay for that technology um, is not um, being a fully accessible instructor. Uh, one in five students live below the federal poverty line and that lack of access to the technology needed for online classes from computers to tablets or even having strong Wi-Fi, it requires strong, expensive Wi-Fi to have your camera on all the time and to have your microphone as well. Um, and to be able to have students share their screen and do presentations. So I have a lot of participation in the chat and I do love that you guys are participating. So some people are saying they don't require, which is great. Um, never see my face of students. Oh, oops, I already read that one, sorry. So she, Marilyn says that she strongly encourages it. They are adults and I do too. I strongly encourage it too. I always say things like, you know, I can't wait to see you guys this morning. I'm so excited to um, see you all this morning. Um, I love when you guys have your cameras on. I can see your bright smiling faces. It's so nice to teach to you all this morning and, and see your faces. Just saying things like that, I feel like does get students to kind of be like, oh, you know, I can turn my camera on. I do have that accessibility. I'm not dealing with competing obligations. So I can turn that on. So those encouraging words, I feel like do encourage the students who just have their cameras off because they just don't want to have them on. But we can't really require it, in my opinion, because we do need to be cognizant of these other things that our students are dealing with as well. Um, Karen says, agreed, it should not be mandatory. Connectivity is one issue, but there are other valid reasons. They all don't have private places in their home to attend class. I ask them to turn it on if they are presenting, if possible. Karen, you know, I do that too. I do ask them to turn it on so that way during speeches, they can actually be presenting to their classmates' faces. Um, but during regular class is when I really don't require it. And then Carol says, lots of images can also be distracting from the main presenter. Yeah, so if we have everyone's cameras on in our classroom, it can be distracting that gallery view from our, for our students, as well as ourselves too. Um, so next we're gonna talk about, you can go to the next slide, Brittany, promoting engagement with other students. So how do we do this in an online environment? How do we get our students to interact with other students in our classrooms in an online environment? That is such a struggle for most instructors that I've come across, and I definitely struggle with it this year as well. And so next slide, please, Brittany. To foster better student, student interaction, um, I implement simple things, but effective things in my classroom. So I do a defined introduction is a great starting point for building student rapport. So something as simple as just doing an introduction the first day of class, if I were teaching um, in person, my first week of class would look like a syllabus and introduction week where we get to know each other as students and teacher. Um, so I do things like an introduction as bio speech where I ask my students a series of questions and then I have them perform their very first speech in class um, where they just answer questions about themselves. You know, what's their dream vacation? Um, what's their you know, in goal with school, um, how many pets do they have? Just fun questions like that, that I've come up with. Um, what could they do for a day? If they could do anything for a day, what would it be? Um, things to get, to let them get to know each other and myself as an instructor, I answer them too. And then I do a discussion board on that and ask them to, you know, share their answers again and then respond to other students. Um, Indra just said, play hot seat. That's a great way to do that as well. There's so many icebreakers that I feel like we can implement in the online virtual environment. And 
even though sometimes we think icebreakers can be redundant, I think they are effective in establishing and building that student-student interaction and connection um, within your online classroom. I also do an any bag speech where I have my students, and this could be used as icebreakers if you don't teach, or you probably don't teach any kind of speech class because uh, you all are CTE, but um, where I have my students bring in a bag or they show a bag on camera with items about themselves. Um, so it can be anything you know, from pictures to I've had students show video game controllers because they're really into video games, but it gives them an artifact, an object for the student to take and then explain and kind of elaborate about themselves further. Um, another way to foster better student student interaction is to promote that netiquette, which if you never heard of this is internet etiquette. And so to um, do this effectively, we want to establish those conventions of politeness about the way we use the internet and interact with others online to provide a foundation for civility between ourselves and our students in the online learning environment. So how I do this is I always have very explicit interaction um, rules, I guess, or very explicit netiquette, if you will, on any discussion boards or any feedback forms that I give my students within my classroom, as well as just when I'm asking questions or if we have a class discussion. I do a lot of class discussions that um, kind of pose debate in my class. And so really establishing that another quit comes into, um, into fruition with those. And so just letting our students know to be respectful, be honest, engage fully in the course, communicate appropriately and respect the privacy of their, um, their fellow students. And then promoting collaboration among students by designing weekly groups assignments or maybe a group project. So I do a group speech in my class. And when I first started teaching this online, I was like, oh my gosh, how am I going to do this group speech in my classroom? Well, thankfully, Zoom has this nifty little thing called breakout rooms. And if you don't know how to use breakout rooms, you absolutely need to learn. But it is great for think, pair, share or um, partner work or group project time and assignments within the online virtual environment. And so I do my group speech exactly how I would in a live class. Um, and when I give them time in class to do work on their group speech or group work days, I do the exact same thing. We just do it in breakout rooms. So they're still having that dedicated time to their group project, getting to know each other in that private breakout room without me in there. I can enter, I do pop in and out, of my students breakout rooms to kind of check in on them just like I would if I was in a classroom I would go around to each group and kind of check in see how they're doing if they have any questions. But it allows them to interact with each other without me hovering um, and that way they can have that student student interaction that they normally would in a live classroom. For that group project or that group assignment or whatever it is um, that group activity that you have built into your lecture um, also having students complete their learning management system profile. So I have my students um, submit a picture on their Canvas. Um, I'm assuming most LMSs have the option to have students picture, or you can encourage students to have their picture on Zoom if they don't wanna share their camera so we can at least see you know, what they look like and, look like and actually meet them. Um, I encourage my students to complete their profile by having things on there like their favorite quote, and maybe their contact info, specifically their email, um, for other students to contact them if they have a, a question in class. Um, things that I notice my students doing in person is they exchange phone numbers, you know, the first day of class, or they ask their, their partner next to them in person, like, hey, did you get the notes from last class? So they're, we're missing, our students are missing that interaction in person um, with each other. And so, having that profile completed can help encourage that interaction that us as instructors don't necessarily take part in in live classrooms but we need to help facilitate in the online classroom um, and then also having that social time with maybe a discussion prompt or like that um, quote of the day i know teachers who do music um, and do like discussion prompts around that, or maybe like a, a current event, something that has nothing to do with your 
lecture for the day, but everything to do with building that connection and fostering that student student, as well as instructor student interaction um, to have that social time. Like my students just took spring break and we talked about what we were gonna do on spring break and where are we gonna travel if we're gonna travel. Um, you know, one of my students was going to Arizona. You know, we talked about that. Just things that you would talk about in person that maybe you're not really planning for online because you are, don't feel like you need to or you're you're missing out on that human interaction. But we can help facilitate that human interaction and bridge that gap if we plan for it. Um, next slide, please, Brittany. And then encouraging critical and reflective discussion can also be how you foster um, and promote engagement with other students. So having online discussions, having those open-ended questions in the chat so that students can see other students reply or encouraging students to unmute themselves and answer those open-ended questions, doing debate type questions, um, having that reflective conversation with your students, polls, um, you can also do things like word clouds. If you've ever heard of poll.com, you can do word clouds where your students actually text in answers to maybe it's a question or a discussion prompt that you've come up with. Um, and they can text in answers and then you can share your screen to the word cloud and they all the answers will pop in and out continuously in a word cloud, electronic word cloud. And you can um, kind of debrief that way with your students, but it allows them all to participate and see the other students' answers, but in a more autonomous way. Um, and to facilitate a safe discussion environment, we, it's important to do that whether we're live or virtual, right? And it's important you model the support and encouragement for diverse points of view. So there is a feeling of being safer in fully engaging in discussions. So you could promote student inter interaction by requiring students to reference ideas from discussions and graded assignments maybe on Canvas later on um, after they've already you know, conversed and you've had that discussion in class where multiple students are answering. You can refer back to that on maybe a graded assignment, homework assignment for the week or discussion post or something like that. Um, next slide, please, Brittany. You can also um, encourage critical and reflective discussion. I think this is a repeat, repeated slide, so I apologize for that. That was a miss edit on my part. Um, but to also, you can set up students, help students set up help teams. Um, so this is something that I think I'm gonna implement next fall. I've just heard about this, um, but students typically will get together and do like study groups or peer assisted learning groups when they're in person. And so you could actually help facilitate that at the beginning of the semester and assign student study groups where they get together and they do exchange emails or exchange phone numbers or whatever they're comfortable with. And that's kind of like their study group for the semester. And so if they have a question about an assignment or a due date, instead of blowing up your email, you can um, expand on the rule of ask three peers than me and you're facilitating their accessibility to their peers because you already have those study groups put into place so that's kind of another strategy that you can do um next slide please Brittany so now we're going to go on to engagement with course content and we're going to talk about some things that I do to promote engagement and some tips and tricks that I've implemented into my virtual classroom so next slide, Brittany. Um, promoting student engagement with course content. I think this is where um, online instructors have had to get really creative this year, even more so. And so some things that I've done, and I'm just sharing from experience, and please, if you have done anything that you just think is so cool and you want other instructors to learn about it, please feel free to unmute yourselves or post in the chat. Um, but these are some of the things that I've done because I do feel like we are our best assets as instructors, our other instructors. We can learn from each other so much. And these are things that I've learned from other instructors or from my own research this year that I've implemented in my classroom. So I've created short audio introductions to each of my modules on Canvas. Um, I record myself on Zoom and then I upload it to the Canvas LMS, or you can even upload it to YouTube. You can make a YouTube account for free 
and upload videos to it for free. And you could just have a quick link um, if your LMS doesn't have um, that kind of capability that Canvas does. Um, and Deer said she did a video or they did a video to introduce myself, which is great. That's awesome to hear. Um, you can also use videos in the classroom for activities and to help facilitate discussions. I tend to do this a lot. Um, Jill says, I like using polls and then taking the info from it to create graphs and charts. Very cool. Uh, my classroom doesn't, I don't really have to facilitate a lot of graphs and charts, but that might be something I could implement too, actually. So thanks for sharing that tip. Um, and also highlighting students' individual experiences as, a, as examples in class concepts. So I have pretty small classes. Um, so I try to not only remember my students' names, but when I do facilitate those kind of more social minutes in my class where we talk about a current event or we talk about what we're gonna do for spring break, what have you, I use those things in further lectures as experiences and examples for class concepts, I use my students' experiences. So I use my student going to um, spring break in Arizona as a example in a future class lecture and that class concept. Um, and also using tools like Bitmoji slides, which we're gonna talk about in a second, interactive Bitmoji homepages on your LMS, Gameably, Jeopardy slides or spin wheel slides, um, polling components of universal design as well for that accessibility component. So you can go to the next slide, Brittany. So these are some resources and some examples that I've compiled of those things that I just talked about that I've been using in my classroom. Uh, so next slide. So this is an example of my PowerPoint slides that I use for my classroom. Not only does this help me facilitate and define my online presence as an instructor because I'm letting my students into my world, but I'm doing it with that boundary of not actually showing them my dogs, not actually showing them, um, you know, what I look like every day necessarily, or, or showing them my office at home, but I'm showing them in, it in a virtual manner. So this is my virtual classroom. I use this just for PowerPoint slides. And I put any lecture bullet points on that whiteboard, just like I would if we were in person, I would be putting things on a whiteboard, right? Um, or writing things on a whiteboard. So I use that. Um, I also use um, this to show empathy and kind of define my online presence like I talked about. Um, you can see I have my dogs, which Total disclaimer, these little animated versions of my dogs are from a graphic designer that I hired for my wedding actually. And then I just screenshotted them. So I can't teach you how to create um, kind of a bitmoji of your dog, but if you know someone who can do that, that would be awesome. But I was able to implement that in my online classroom and then also implement my own bitmoji. If you don't know how to make a bitmoji or you aren't familiar with this, there's so many different things that you can do with it and interact with it. Um, I implement it on my Canvas assignments and my Canvas classroom. And then I do it on all my PowerPoint slides as well. And I find that my students, it just helps me seem more like a person um, and not just a box on my online classes. And so I have provided some resources for how to build these if you aren't familiar with this concept. Um, next slide, please, Brittany. So this is another example of something that I did the first day of class. I did show a picture of what I actually look like. And I talked a little bit about myself and my experiences and kind of my background, where I've worked and what constitutes me to really be their instructor. Next slide, please, Brittany. I talked about, you know, my husband and my dogs. So I did show them pictures of myself, but I wasn't physically showing them these things on camera, right? But it allowed them to relate to me and, and, and to see me as an instructor who's going to lead with empathy and flexibility. Um, and I emphasize that not only in my syllabus, but at the beginning of my classes as well. Next slide. And again, I talk about my favorite things, just like I said that I have them do as well to promote that student student interaction too. So these are all just, I'm just showing you these screenshots as examples of how I utilize my Bitmoji classroom. 
but you can really do this in any manner. It can be completely autonomous. So if you go to the next slide, this is another instructor at Richland who's done interactive homepages in their virtual classroom. And so everything you see is a link. So the UNO cards down there is a link to an uh, UNO activity that she does. Um, the crayons down there at the bottom shelf is a link to a artistic, I think, activity or, or something that she does. Um, I think it's actually an article about occupational therapy, but you get the point. So you can make them this interactive classroom. You can link these images and have those be accessible to your students um, for a more creative and interactive design. Next slide. This is just another example as well um, of another teacher. So if you're going to show your students a YouTube video during lecture that day, you can have, um, you know, the other resources she has over here. You can really get creative with this. And I know this might seem so overwhelming, but I've provided some really great resources on the next slide, Brittany, for you and some training videos as well. So I don't have time to teach you how to do this, um, create a Bitmoji virtual classroom if you're interested, but I did actually do a training video for Richland on it. And I've included that link in the slides and the slides are gonna be made available to you. Um, after this session. So don't worry about that. Um, and then I've also included a link, um, that YouTube link under build a, a bit more interactive homepage is from the other instructor at Richland who actually built the interactive Bitmoji homepages on her canvas. And so she goes through and teaches you and it's an instructional video um, and resource that I have gotten permission from her to share with you all. She's from, I do want to give Richland and her the, the credit. Um, her name is Christy and she's a professor of sociology at Richland, um, but she did a training video on it as well. And these are some great resources that if you are interested in implementing this in your classroom, you can utilize um, as well as some articles and some instructions about different tools that I used and she used to build the classrooms um, on Bitmoji. Next slide. Another resource that I wanna provide you is something new that I've just found out about. And then I wanna implement in my class next fall. If you've never heard of it, it's called Gameably, and that's the website for it. Again, you'll get the slide deck. Um, you can actually do like leaderboards, you can create levels and challenges and badges on this website. It is completely free to you. You would create a username and then you create what's called like a world for your students. And in this world, you can have your students do things um, like assignments or participation points or um, participating in maybe just a class concept for that week, whatever. You can have them do those things within the world and then they get points and their points can turn into levels or can turn into badges um, and they can complete challenges in order to do that. You can even do things like um, checkpoints to see if they're paying attention. So you can put keywords in your lectures and then make yourself say them during lecture. And then if your students hear those keywords, they can go to your gameably world that you assign them and they can type it in and then they'll get the points for that day because they were listening to your lecture and they caught the keyword. And then those points again can lead to levels and badges and you can give them um, things like extra credit. This is a great way to award that for the classroom or maybe some other um, things that you have accessibility to give your students. Um, there's also the thing that I love about this and I haven't had a chance to master off that as much as I would like is that you can actually see over to the left is a screenshot of what other teachers are doing in their classrooms to utilize this app. And it is an app that's a website. So you would access it from like your Google Chrome browser um, and your students would too. And it's as easily as accessible to your students as it is to you because all they have to do is click on a code that you give them and it will link them straight to your world. Um, so you don't have, they don't have to create their own username and password and things like that. They just have a, a code that you give them for your world link to your classroom. So it's very cool. So if you're interested in that, you can check that out more. Um, next slide, please. We're running a little low on our time here. Um, this is just some, again, some more screenshots of things that teachers are doing in their classrooms. So again, we are our, we are our best assets um, as other teachers for 
online engagement. And so, you know, doing things like this and learning how to implement them in your classroom, this is a great way to get some ideas. Next slide, please, Brittany. This is also another thing that I wanna start using in my classroom. Um, I haven't yet, but it's called Padlet. I'm not sure if any of you are familiar with it, but it's a website where you can upload resources to it and then your students can actually comment on them. So let's say you have your student, you want your students to read maybe a short, short article during class and then you want them to just comment their thoughts on it and then maybe you're gonna debrief on it. So let's say you give them you know, 10 minutes in class time to read the short article and um, form an opinion on it and then you debrief on it. So they can look at this, click this link to Padlet that you've uploaded the resource to, click on the resource, read the resource, and then comment on the resource on Padlet their thoughts. So this is another really cool tool that I wanna start implementing. Or maybe you just want a more fun, interactive way to house resources for your lecture that day. You can do that here as well. Or maybe your students read one of your resources that you have and they have a question on it. They can actually comment directly on that resource. Hey, I have a question about this line in this resource. And you can respond and interact with them through this Padlet um, link that you've created with your resources for that day. Um, Elena, do students need to make an account to use Padlet? No, it is a direct link. So you'll make an account and you'll upload the resources, but they do not need to make an account. It's a direct link for them and they would have access to it. Next slide, please, Brittany. So next, I wanna take a couple minutes, we only have about four, um, to just share your ideas and resources that you've used in the classroom. If you have anything you'd like to share, um, I love to learn from you from my own classroom and I've, I'm sure everyone would love to hear from everyone if there's anything interesting and cool that you've done maybe this past year to promote online engagement or any strategies, any tools that you found out about, um, and also, if you have any questions for me, please feel free to ask those at this time. You can unmute yourselves or um, respond in the chat. I see that Andrea, you said you love the interactive Bitmoji classroom, so useful and fun. You use that this semester. That's awesome. I know a lot of teachers did, which is great. Was someone going to unmute themselves? I was. It's Andrea Bray. Hi. Yeah, I do. I love the Bitmoji classroom because you can put so many resources in one place. So if students get lost, they can always go back to that and find like those basic pieces they needed. Absolutely. Yeah. And if they know that it's, if they know what they're looking for is linked to that lecture like they're they're like oh i know andrea spoke about this in class during this concept or during this day and they're looking for that specific resource it's right there in your slides for them uh, absolutely thank you for sharing andrea and then i don't see anything else coming through so Brittany, can you go to the next slide so the next thing i want to talk about is just improving your online course accessibility for all of your students so having course materials that don't create barriers to learning is an ongoing need for students in online education and so looking into offering things like closed captioning capabilities um i do this for my students because i do have a student who is hard of hearing typically your colleges probably let you know if your student needs an accommodation but some students might not feel comfortable getting an accommodation if they feel like they're disability or whatever it is that they're dealing with isn't maybe as severe as other students. So maybe they don't feel comfortable really getting an accommodation because they just have a slight hard of hearing um, disability, but maybe closed captioning would help them, you know, or maybe it would just help your students who are even hearing, but it would help them retain the lecture better because you don't have a lot of words on your PowerPoints and you, a lot of the content that you're giving is you know, verbal content through your microphone. So maybe closed captioning would help them take better notes. These are things that you can ask your students privately um, to uh, coincide with HIPAA.
but privately, um, obviously you can, you know, maybe take an anonymous poll at the beginning of your semester, asking students to indicate if they feel things like this might help them. You don't even have to phrase it as reasonable accommodation. You can just say things like, you know, do you feel like closed captioning would help you learn better? Um, do you feel like highlighting or coloring key terms on my slides would help you learn better, help you retain information better? Um, do you prefer to have, you know, you always hear um, people tell you don't put a lot of words on your slides. And I have students who prefer that and I have students who don't prefer that. So maybe you take a poll at the beginning, of your very first class and ask, you know, do you like when instructors have a lot of content and definitions on slides? Or do you like when they don't? Do you like when your instructors lecture more or do you like more activities? And you can really gauge how your students learn best if you just ask them and improve that accessibility for them that way. Um, also, this is a great resource for colorblindness. Um, it's an article with um, information and strategies on how to have accessible color usage on the internet. So on your PowerPoint slides or even on your um, Canvas modules or videos that you're creating for your students, it's important to take that into account. Um, as well as providing ample examples for access for your students on their own time and having key representation of assignments, not just outlines. This is something I do. I provide um, my expectations for assignments is so autonomous because I teach a speech class. So I provide past student examples that aren't necessarily A's. Um, typically, they're more B assignments, but I provide that example for my current students from a past student, you know, deleting the student's name and everything. So my students can gauge and have that key representation of what my expectations are for the assignment that they're turning in. Um, so those are things that you can implement in your own classroom as well. So it is 201, I ran a little bit over. The next slide is just all the resources that I've shared. So you have access to all of these um, when you download this slide deck. And if you have any questions, feel free to put those in the chat or unmute yourselves. Um, yeah, Brittany, anything on your end? No, I just wanna say um, thank you, Kirsten, for sharing this great information. I'm seeing a lot of thank yous, very helpful, great presentation. Um, so thank you guys for participating. We will be uploading um, the slides and the recording to our website. Um, within this week. And I did see a question come through about getting a certificate. Um, so if you want a certificate for um, proof of participation, please feel free, you should have the email address. Um, actually, it might be my email address because this is my Zoom platform. But if it's my email address or ICSPS at ilstu.edu, if you reach out, um, to that email address, we can get you a certificate of participation for um, if you need that. So yes, Kirsten just put that in the chat for everyone there. So again, thank you guys so much. We hope it was helpful and we'll see you at our next webinar. Thank you everyone. Have a great rest of your day.